at its core, a good leader is authentic. And it is absolutely okay as a leader to admit that you don't know. And the more you can use that as a tool in your box to establish that you are a leader who listens, the faster you're actually gonna be able to lead. Hi everyone, I'm Peter Barron. And I'm Brendan Schneider. And welcome to the Leadership Backstory. So Brendan, you know, I'm like super jacked for today's conversation. Yeah. I think today's gonna be fun. We've got a really interesting guest on tap. But how are you feeling? Yeah, I can't wait. Being a marketing guy, uh, when I was yeah. doing research for Doug, super excited. So yeah. let's get going. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, we were bringing on uh, Doug Zarkin. So Doug was most recently the VP and CMO at Pearl Vision. He's had an amazing career, uh, like lots of leadership nuggets. I mean, just in the pre pre work that I did preparing for this, like so many interesting philosophies when it comes to like how do you grow teams and you know what are the things that you look for to you know um, help people succeed and, and help a company succeed. So I'm excited for it. So Doug, welcome to the podcast. You know, thanks. If you could do me a favor and summarize that research so I can send it to my 82 year old father who's uh, living in Del Boca Vista, I still think he made things. I just make ads for a living. Um, so any any help would be greatly appreciated. Uh, ha happy happy to summarize and send. Not a, not a problem. Good. Hey, listen before we before we got going, you know, we we were talking a little bit about where you thought you, where you, your re leadership um, journey started, and you talked about literally like graduating college on a Sunday and then enrolling on in in a graduate MBA program on on a Monday. Like, talk to us about that. That's pretty that's pretty wild. Yeah. You know, first of all, it's great to be here. I, I love the premise of this podcast because I think, you know, all too often, you know, we, we hear interviews and, and about leaders and what they've accomplished professionally, but it's really the humanity behind them and, and their journey. And my journey began um, really the day after I graduated from, from George Washington University. I started at the uh, MBA slash JD program at American University. And I remember walking into, I think it was my first business law class in a fraternity sweatshirt. And there were all of these like grown ups and government officials there because American was a big feeder program for some of the, the government institutions in the area. And realizing very quickly that uh, I needed to grow up. Um, and if I was going to be a part of this institution and I was going to be in work groups with these folks and doing case study work that I very quickly not only needed to, to figure out how to listen, but more importantly, what kind of leader was I going to be? Um, because what they saw was, you know, a, a kid wearing his fraternity letters with an earring still in his ear. And most of these folks were, were consummate professionals. So I had to start thinking about my leadership journey from, from day one. Yeah. Where did you start? Like, how did you, how did you start forming it? <laughs> you know, I, I, called the person that at the time I, and even today I still go to for, uh, for good advice, which was my dad. Um, and even though he still doesn't have an idea what I do, he knows me better than I know myself. And what he said to me was, you know, Doug, Um, you know, you in an education environment didn't need to have all the answers. You just kind of needed to know where the questions began from. And so what I figured out pretty quickly was if I asked really good questions, it made me sound really smart, but at the same time also kind of gave me the tools that I needed to eventually become a stronger leader and a stronger member of the academic community. That's pretty profound. I mean, at that age to figure that out, we've talked to a whole bunch of people Gosh, Brendan, like, uh, you know, what's like the one of the major themes that we hear more often than not, like when people are in their 20s and they emerge like as leaders and they start managing teams, like it, it seems consistently people are saying like, I didn't know what the hell I yeah. was doing. I screwed that up royally. Like, I, I, it's like, it's embarrassing to think about. <laughs> and I think Brendan and I live that life too, right? Yeah. Like, so it's not, we're not speaking out of turn. So you went through this MBA program and you did it. What, what did you say? You did it in 13 months or something? 13 months. I went in based on undergrad academics as as almost a full second year MBA student, um, which was a great advantage in that I was able to, because I was on scholarship, on academic fellowship. I was able to get through the program in 13 months. It was a huge pressure on myself because yeah. I decided very early in my academics in graduate school that I didn't want to be a lawyer. Uh, it was actually after that business law class 
even though I did well, I realized that the law wasn't for me. And so I just plowed through getting my MBA. It put me at a disadvantage in that I was like swimming with the sharks. You know, the, the depth of thinking I didn't have. Undergrad taught me really how to memorize. It wasn't until I got to graduate school that taught me how to think. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, talk about my journey. I, I was absolutely an incomplete thinker in graduate school and, and definitely yeah. came out the other end with a little bit more tools in my box, figuring out how to process through situations. Yeah. What does that mean, incomplete thinker? Like, where did you see the gaps? You know, I think in, in, in undergrad too often, you're sort of told that the answer lies somewhere between A, B, C, and D. And, you know, when you're memorizing, you know, hundreds of facts for a, a, a final in, in, you know, psychology or philosophy or economics, you can kind of get into that mindset pretty easily. Um, what I started to realize was that there was a perspective because I was in class with folks that were at the time, probably seven or eight years, my, my senior, mm -hmm. um, I used to think they were so old. I think maybe they were 30. Um, they had real furniture. I had Ikea furniture. That was how I defined real adults at that time. Um, but they were bringing a perspective that I didn't have. I didn't really appreciate beginning my journey into higher education that the answer doesn't always lie somewhere into the questions that you've been given. Mm -hmm. You know, the skill of being able to ask good questions to eventually find the answer that may not exist on the paper. And that kind of speaks to my philosophy that I've tried to keep in every role I've had this notion of thinking differently. Yeah. Um, yeah. You just, something, something that really resonates with me is like asking good questions. You know, I, I just finished, I just finished the book, book of beautiful questions. And it's like, ah, uh, you know, like the first question you ask is not the last question that you're going to ask. It's like, how do you progress and ask better and better questions in order to figure out like, what is the answer to whatever problem you're solving? And, but yet I, it's taken me years to figure that out, to be able to understand that at earlier age yeah. is interesting. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a profound question. It could be as simple as one of my favorite go-tos is, you know, help me to understand, mm. which is basically a little bit of a less threatening way than to, to say either why, which is a terrible question to ask, <laughs> yeah. or calling somebody out on their bullshit. Yeah. Um, if you present it as, you know, help me to understand how you arrived at that perspective, um, you could begin to see either their logic train build or their logic train unravel which for me as somebody who's curious, but at the same time, pretty quick to form an opinion, it gives me a chance to anchor my perspective and what path am I going down? Am I going down the path of I need to know more or am I going down the path of I've heard enough and now let's think about this course of action to take. Hmm. So you graduated uh, in 13 months you know, and it, so there was no, like you didn't work full time in between. Like you, you bet you were a professional student from you know, kindergarten all the way through graduate, graduate school. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I was, I was on academic fellowships. So I was working at the university. I also, yeah. um, you know, worked <laughs> one of my internships when I was in grad school was I, I worked for a, um, a real estate firm in Washington, DC. And, um, the daughter of the founder, again, I, you know, I would call her a grown up. Maybe she was like 32 or 33. Um, opened up like a New York style nightclub in in Washington D.C. and I helped write the business plan for it. And in return for helping write the business plan, I got a chance to be a be a bouncer at the private level. Um, I never made as much cash in my entire life. I mean, to this day, as I made as I made you know as a security guy. Um, but it was a really cool job. I learned the bar business. I learned the entertainment business. I learned. A little bit of a different side of the world of business for sure you know transactions that happen at alleys and at night you know a different culture um you know some of my best jobs in my career were jobs that i did part-time or while i was home on vacation because i just i did things that i wouldn't normally do i worked in a in a meat packing facility in new york city during christmas break um and you know waking up at two o'clock in the morning and delivering meat to these restaurants that in night I'd end up showing up to and they'd be like, do I know you? And I'm like, no, you don't know me, but I know yeah. you and I know where you got your steak from. Yeah. Summer jobs, man. What a great training ground. Brendan, do you have a, you have a crazy summer job? Oh, I've had a bunch, but I, I just want to ask Doug, do, you know, you seem like thoughtful and profound at a young age, which I was not. Did you have a plan when you were going into graduate school? Like what was the path? Where were you, where were you going? Yeah. Did you know? I, I, so 
I can talk about it intelligently now um, because it's in hindsight. I was figuring it out as I was going. You know, I was one of those kids in high school that didn't really study but did pretty well. Um, and in college, I didn't really learn how to study until my sophomore year. And so I was a, a constant, I would say, underachiever. And after a while, I started to get a chip on my shoulder about it um, and realize that the easiest way to do something about it is just do something about it. And so I got some very good career advice. This is the world pre-LinkedIn, you know, beginnings of email, beginnings of the World Wide Web, you know, think AOL five, you know, five floppy disk installation that if you eventually want to run a business or run a brand, get on at the end of the communication train and work your way to the front, you'll not only understand all the roles and functions that go, that go into it. You'll speak the language and most importantly, you'll be able to motivate those people in those seats because it is not about you, the individual. It is about your ability to lead a group of individuals to a collective purpose. And, you know, the, the skill of leadership is something that I'm still learning and I'm getting better at it every day, but it was something that was, was pretty much ingrained in me from the beginning that I had to figure out how to master. So once I, you know, I, I knew pretty early on that I wasn't going to be a lawyer. So I stopped my law degree and I did my MBA as we talked about. And, um, I thought I was going to go to wall street to be the next, you know, Bud Fox, you know, of wall street fame and interviewed at, you know, you know, Morgan and Lehman brothers. And what they basically told me was that, you know, for a good two years, I would do whatever they told me to do at whatever hours. And if they were lucky, you know, eventually I would start to make real money. And that just rubbed me completely the wrong way because I, maybe it was a little bit of ego talking, but I felt that I had some tools in my toolbox and I was ready to go do something. And so a family friend said, look, you know, I was an MBA, I had MBA in marketing, you know, building brands, so important. Um, get in, get it in that lane by getting on the train in the world of media and advertising. And so I went to work in the agency world and started out in media and went to account management and eventually started a, a, a pretty sizable division of a pretty large agency and eventually made my, my jump to the dark side or the client side, as we would call it. And, um, you know, it's an incredibly terrifyingly exciting role to run a business and run a brand. Um, it really is, especially one like my, my, my last role at Pearl, where it's a franchise model and you have people whose livelihoods are dependent on your ability to be good at what you do. Um, and, you know, Billie Jean King says pressure is a privilege. Um, it was absolutely a privilege to, to have that pressure for almost 11 years. So as you're working your way towards that Pearl job, I mean, what were you learning? I mean, I see that you, you, you were a VP at Gray Advertising, then you went over and you're at Avon. You did all sorts of really interesting things. Like what were some of the leadership principles that you acquired along the way? Learning how to lead. Yeah. Um, you know, early on, you're, you're taught a little bit more about the me versus the we in terms of leadership. You know, it's about what you can accomplish, how you can do something. That's leadership. It's not really leadership, it's accomplishment. Um, it probably wasn't until, honestly, I would say when, it, when, I, when I came to Pearl that I really started to come to my own as a leader, um, that I started to embrace that it's one thing to, to reach the mountain in record time, or mountaintop in record time. It's another thing to take a selfie by yourself. And it's even another thing to take a group picture. The group picture is a lot more satisfying than the selfie. Um, and even though it might take a little longer, the joy that you have when you're celebrating at the top of the mountain with your team is, is pretty epic. And, you know, I learned the importance of team more in the last 11 years than I did probably in the first 20. I learned the importance of casting a team. And I don't mean that from a DEI perspective. I mean that from a mindset perspective, Do you want to surround yourself with people who don't necessarily think the same way you do, but have common things that you can lock onto. Like for me, you know, I hire for passion. I want people who give a shit because I can't teach you to care. You either care or you don't. 
I can teach you the skill, but I can't give you the will. Um, I can motivate that will. I can harness that. I can fuel it, but it's either in you or it's not. Um, you know, to use a sports metaphor, how many number one, you know, first round draft picks flame out? It's not just like because they don't have the skill. Part of the time, it's they didn't have the will. They didn't do the film study. Yeah. Um, so those are some things that I learned. How did you, how do you how do you figure that out? Like, how do you figure out if somebody cares or not? Oh, it's really easy for me. I mean, it, yeah. it, it's. You know, I lead with passion. That's kind of my leadership style. Yeah. Um, I think you have to be an, an evangelist in order to get the best out of people. I also really focus on, you know, the person behind the eyes, no pun intended. You know, every single one of us, especially post COVID kind of has a movie playing in their head and that movie could be a comedy. It could be a tragedy. It could be a, you know, a romance, um, love story. We We've had to, as leaders, really invest more in understanding the people that work with us on our businesses um, than ever before. So I try to really get to know the person because then I can figure out how I can light a fire under that person. And everybody's different. People get motivated by different things. Your job as a leader is to figure out what those things are and and light them up. Um, But the acid test on whether you're passionate or not, that's super simple for me to figure out. Hey, when you got to Pearl, what was this? What was the, what was the state of the company? Like what, what were some of the, cha- like why did so, they, what were some of the challenges? Yeah, yeah I, I, it's very, it, it, there's a great story. I'll summarize it in 30 seconds, which is on my very first day of, of work, I turned on my brand new shiny laptop and very first email was from the chairman of the Franchise Advisory Council, which is in a franchise system. It's sort of like Speaker of the House of Representatives. Mm-hmm. And the, the email said, you know, dear Doug, welcome to Pearl Vision. I hope you suck less than the last person who had your job. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, I can't make that up. Um, yeah. and what's funny is, is his son is actually now, cause the business was passed down to his son is now the, the most current franchise advisory council chairman. And you know, when, when I was leaving the business, I, I told him the story and he's like, yeah, you've, you've definitely sucked a hell of a lot less, you know? So, um, the business really needed, needed focus. It, it was, an iconic brand that kind of had lost its way. I like to talk about brands in in relationship terms. I would say Pearl Vision was really stuck in the friend zone. You know, we've all been in the friend zone before, to use the dating analogy. It meant a lot of things to a lot of people, which means it didn't really mean something to someone. We were a nice brand. We were okay, but there was not a lot that was compelling that was going to really motivate that loyalty, that that deep relationship. And so my job was to really figure out how to create brand love um, and brand stickiness, not only to grow the profitability of the business, but also to help grow the franchisee footprint. Yeah. And I'm really curious what you did there, but be- before I, w- when people use the word brand, I think it can mean some you know different things to different people. Like w- what does brand mean to you? Brand is nothing more than a set of emotions, feelings, and perceptions, a set of, a set of ideals that people share. Mm. Yeah. They want to see themselves in, in the, the organizations that they, they, they frequent, right? Um, I think they need to be able to recognize what the values of said organization are. You know, not everybody who works for Fox believes in the values of Fox, much like not everybody who works for MSNBC believes in the values of MSNBC. But in order to advocate for those brands, you have to understand what those brands stand for. So when you got there and you you realized you had brand work to do, you know, there's a couple paths, like there's a business path that you have to take, but then there's a leadership path that you have to take too, in order to get to those uh, uh, the goals. Cause you got to obviously motivate people to, to do the things that are best for the brand revitalization. Like, what did that look like? Like, how did you even start that process? You know, I, I hate to give him credit because if he, I mean, he won't listen to this because he doesn't understand podcasting, but I go back to what my dad told me, which is, you know, you gotta, you gotta listen in order to lead. Um, you know, when I was at Avon, you're looking at one of the, or listening, talking to one of the few guys that was actually an Avon lady. I went out into the field and I sold lip gloss. And as confusing as that is for my 15 year old daughter, um, it, it really helped me understand the business. When, when I joined Pearl, I worked in a couple of our, of our eye care centers, but most importantly, what I did, and this is, this is interesting. Um, if you ever want to learn about yourself on your best day and your worst day, talk to somebody who broke up with you like in a relationship. The reason is, is because you will get brutal truth. And so I interviewed what I called the exes. I went, I found franchisees that had fired us. I found patients that had fired us. And I wanted to understand what didn't we do? 
Like what were the expectations that we initially said we were going to deliver that caused you to actually engage? And then why did you break up with us? And that was so incredibly valuable as it was talking to some of our longstanding and new franchisees. The answers were there. It was like buying a house that is terribly decorated. You have to strip the crap off the walls. The bones are really good. The bones of this business were actually pretty damn good. There was just a lot of crap that was on the walls. What did you learn? So my job, what did I learn? I learned that at its heart, Pearl Vision is a brand that is about a best in class doctor with an unmatched commitment to care from the exam room to the retail floor, combining the finest assortment of frames and lenses to become that neighborhood destination that people should trust with their eye care and eyewear needs. And my job was to articulate that and then distill that down into a brand positioning that would allow us as a business unit to move forward. And, you know, 11 years later, we are the number one brand in optical retail on franchises, the entrepreneurs franchise 500. I think we're the top 7% of all franchise brands. More importantly, um, we are a brand that is growing and a brand that Google tells you based on its rating that we are highly trusted. And that's so all great get things. There? Yeah. How did you get there? Like what, what, yeah. what was that path like for you? We, you know, the complexity really res- resides in the simplicity. You know, we, we had to get back to basics. We had to get back to the notion that, you know, how is trust earned? Trust is earned through small moments of care and connection. It's not through BOGO. This brand was living on the buy one, get one free drug for two decades. And we, we had to build a stronger brand value equation. You know, brand value, it's a very simple equation. Brand value equals experience as your numerator divided by price as your denominator. You would never pay $20 for a hamburger at Burger King, but you would happily pay $20 for a hamburger at Smith & Walensky's or Mastro's or any fine steakhouse. And there's a reason for that. The experience, the quality, not anything against a Whopper. I mean, who doesn't enjoy a good Whopper? But there is a gestalt that comes with delivering a strong brand experience. And here's the nasty little secret. It is perfectly fine to be profitable and deliver an amazing experience. You shouldn't have to apologize for making money. So as long as your brand experience is is positive in that, that fractional equation, you can be as profitable as you want to be. And we had to explain that to our franchisees that, You can actually be more profitable by selling less product at greater margin by driving up the experience that you were delivering during your interaction. How many, at the time when you arrived, how many franchises were there roughly? So we were, we were just north of of 500 total locations between corporate and franchise. And I think at the time we were in the 60% range for franchisees. So 60% of those locations today were just south of, of 600 and, you know, 80 plus percent of the locations are owned by franchisees. Most of our locations are owned by single owners. Yeah. Wow. So I'm just thinking through like the change management of that. And as a leader, how did you make that happen? Because that's all, that's a lot of different constituents that you had to, yeah, you had to convince like there's a, there's a better way. Yeah. Um, you know, it, well. I like to say there's not a right way or a wrong way. There's just a way. And Mm -hmm. what we needed to do was, was convince them that the way forward was to focus on quality of care and experience. It wasn't focusing on discounting or really even wasn't focusing on product. It was focusing on the how, not just the what, you know, one out of every two sunglasses in the world sold is a Ray-Ban. The fact that we carry Ray-Ban doesn't make us unique. What makes us unique is how we guide a patient into their perfect pair. Um, one of the best worst mistakes I made in my 11 years there was, was at our first summit in Atlanta, Georgia, um, February, 20, 2013, I stood up on the stage in front of, a, you know, seven, 800 people and I gave out my personal cell phone. And I did that because I wanted the community to know that I was in it to win it, that I wanted to hear from you. You needed to trust me. And the only way I could earn your trust is to earn it by saying what I would do and doing what I said I was going to do. And that started with opening a dialogue. And yes, you know, seven o'clock in the morning phone calls, getting ready to take my son to a soccer game, not pleasant. 
But those calls eventually turned into a, hey, I hear you're coming into town. Can I have you over at our house for dinner? Like it was a great move that worked out really well, but not everything I did worked perfectly. You know, I, I grossly underestimated as a leader how hard it was going to be to change the narrative of this brand. Um, I thought I could do it in two years. It took me almost five. Um, and that's because we had to change the culture along with the, the narrative that consumers saw. We had, to, we had to live up to the experience that we were projecting in our marketing. And, you know, I went a little too fast. But you know what? When everything caught up with each other, man, first five years were great. The second five years were epic. Once you got it over that, it got it over that kind of tipping point, even, right? Even during yeah. the pandemic. I mean, even during the pandemic, we had, we had a phenomenal second half of the year during 2020. And I say that only because we had spent so much time earning trust from those in the community that when we went from everyday care to essential care, which is really what the pandemic did to us, we didn't really fully close or say Pearl didn't really fully close, but we, you know, the brand had to scale back its operations. When we started to turn the lights back on, they came back, you know, they came back and they came back fast and they came back hard and they came back appreciative. And the challenge was then trying to figure out how to forecast what 21 was going to be and what 22 was going to be because you were dealing with completely changed purchase cycles and completely changed sets of expectations. The good news is the change in expectation for us was just continuing to do better on the things we were doing well, which was deliver an amazing experience. When you were looking at, like when you were re reimagining the experience, did you look to other industries to see how they did it or, or other companies to see how, how it was done? I did. Um, I, I looked at um, dental, which is a little bit behind optical. I looked at pharmacy, which was a little further, faster. Um, I tried to find analogies of brands and businesses that had done a really good job of um, establishing their connection with the community. And believe it or not, you know the folks at Walgreens and TD Bank. Um, brands that I've really spent a lot of time analyzing because I think they do a phenomenal job in connecting at the community level. Same thing with, with car dealers. You know, we, there's not a little league team on the planet that isn't sponsored by a local dealership. There's a reason for that. Um, and I used to think it was silly until I understood how powerful that really is. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask like, what was the common denominator, but it, but I think you, you started to hit on some of it right there. Yeah, the common denominator was, was recognizing that whether your business is franchise, whether your business is big or small, your connection to the community in which you are in, it does not get better than that. And if you do that well, that is the thing that cures all. Become a community-based business. There is a reason why all of us, the, the three of us that we've just met, each of us has, I'm going to take a, take a stab at this, a local pizza place where we get pizza from, right? We know the, the, the family who runs it or the, the people behind the counter, male or female, and they know us. They know our kids. They know our order. And there's a reason. And it may not be the best pizza we've ever had, but there is a connection to that. They're really good at that. They're really good at forging local connections, community businesses. There's not a class party, little league you know, ceremony, high school something that the neighborhood pizza place doesn't deliver food to. Um, they're really good because they think human. And that's a, a big theme with me as a leader and as a, as a person, which is bring the humanity back into your business. Do good work while doing good. It doesn't get better. I want to shift a little bit, Doug. You mentioned that your father was a mentor. Talk to me about some of the other uh, maybe mentors or people that you've modeled some leadership after, some good examples, and are there some bad examples? Oh, um, the bad, there's a, there's a whole host of bad ones. Working for an awful boss is, um, incredibly important in your life. You know, you, you should be lucky that you don't have too many, but working for somebody who is terrible. And I have unfortunately worked for several, you learn a lot about yourself and you learn about what kind of leader you want to be. Um, you know, when you have the moment to celebrate 
an accomplishment in which you fled, how generous are you with sharing the spotlight? Um, I've been blessed in that I've had some honors bestowed upon me. But if you read any of the articles or, or any time I'm mentioned, I'm, I'm always very quick to try to talk about the team and not just our internal team, but the partners that we've worked with. Because, you know, as, as Bo Schembechler likes to say, as a Michigan football fan, the team, the team, the team, it's so important. Um, but, you know, I, I once had a leader stand up and take credit for a program that I did. And I remember sitting in the audience and I, I started to shake. Like I started to shake, not violently, but I started to shake as if I was freezing cold. What it was, was my adrenaline. And I never forgot that feeling. And while I may be the one on stage recently sharing programs, very quickly in that narrative is a call out for the people that are actually doing it. Or I'm sharing the stage with somebody who actually did you know, some of the hard work. Um, but I've been blessed to work with some great people also in my career who gave me enough rope to climb up, um, maybe begin to choke myself out, but not completely do the deed so that I learned a lesson and, and more importantly, were there in the moment um, to give me feedback. And I think that's a pretty important lesson as a leader. Real-time feedback is a blessing. You know, nobody likes to get a, a performance review at the end of the year and say, well, remember in February when we had this meeting and you said this, you're like, why didn't you tell me in February? I'm a big fan of celebrating the small moment, the win when somebody steps up and does a great job, but also picking up the phone and be like, look, that was, that was a little scary. Let's talk a little bit. What happened? You know, and you can, you can diffuse even an epic fail by being timely about it. You also can create a culture of it's okay to have those learning experiences. You know, there's three types of, of errors. There's learning experiences, which we all have every day. That's the first time something goes wrong. A mistake is the second time that same thing goes wrong. Usually a mistake happens when somebody's overworked or just, you know, as they say, shit happens. It's the third time that I like to call the, we need to have a chat. And that third time you try to minimize, but Inevitably, it will happen. It'll happen to you as a leader. And how do you prepare yourself for that chat? If you have real-time feedback, then that chat should not be unexpected. And it doesn't need to come with the vitriol and the anger. It comes with the, you know, how many times did we sit in our kitchens growing up and be like, I'm really disappointed in you. That, that's a bigger punch in the gut than, you know, mom or dad in your face screaming and yelling and telling you you're punished. Now, I say that being the father of a 13-year-old boy and a 15-year-old daughter, and I wish I practiced that a little bit more at times. But, you know, do as I say, not as I do, as they, as they like to say in the parenting handbook. Yeah. You know, you, you talk a lot about humanity, right? Um, and bringing humanity back into business. But being a marketing person, you know, there's like volumes of data that are being washed over you every day, you know, d different consumer habits, what, what have you. Like, how do you marry that together? How do you marry the human side with the analytical side. So, you know, I like to say data doesn't make decisions for the modern day marketer. The modern day marketer makes decisions using data. And the reason why we I say that is because data truly is only as good as the questions that you ask. And how do you know what questions to ask? You cannot hide behind a screen. You cannot hide behind your desk. You have to experience your brand at the front lines to really understand the nuances. And if you're in an e-com business, be a customer service representative. You know, if you're sell tickets, really understand what's happening at the front line. If you have a brick and mortar element, go out and work at one of your locations as a skilled or an unskilled worker, or just simply take a couple, go to a random location, take a bunch of them out to, to lunch, a $200 lunch with 10 people, you know, over a couple of pizzas, you can learn a lot. Know what questions to ask. You know, at the end of the day, if there's more than five things you're focusing on, you're spending less than 20% of your time on any one of those, you're probably not going to make a meaningful shift. You got to figure out about priorities. Because something can be measured may mean that it's meaningful, but it certainly doesn't mean that it's valuable. And trying to get to the genesis of what is valuable data is... Um, it's a pretty big hurdle that I think we're all trying to leap over these days. Hey, before we wrap up, I uh, I see a lot of sports memorabilia behind you. 
you know, and a lot of New York memorabilia, which as a you know lifelong Boston, New England fan is always a little painful, but that's okay. Like I respect what they've done in New York. There's a lot of good stuff that's happened there. Like what does sports mean to you in terms of leadership? Like, how, like what do you glean from, you know, you've talked about team earlier, but like, like what do you take from that realm and apply to yours? Um, so as a, as a struggling yet, active tennis player in my grown up years now, but as a very average athlete, I was an average athlete in every sport. I was a good athlete across all sports. I was never a great athlete. Um, I have a, a son who is a, a very good athlete. And what I try to teach him is the importance of what happens. Let's use baseball because that's his sport. He's, he's the catcher, starting catcher on his team. And you learn life skills, social skills, leadership skills in the dugout and on the field that you can apply for the rest of your life. Sports is the ultimate, ultimate test at any age of your ability to face adversity. You know, I, I would love nothing more than for my son to never experience failure. I would love for my daughter to never experience failure. Both of my kids play sports growing up. My daughter, not so much anymore. My son is, is knee deep in it. And learning how to lose and learning the feeling of losing is something that is incredibly important. Losing because it's your fault, because you didn't go the extra effort, because you didn't take the time. There is nothing more valuable than learning that lesson in a literally game that doesn't matter in the scope of life, but it matters in the way in which you lead your life. You know, you strike out the hardest thing in sports is to hit a baseball. Okay. You bat 400, you're in the hall of fame. That means six times you go up to bat, you don't hit the ball or you're out. Imagine in business, if six out of every 10 decisions you made were wrong, and yet you'd be considered a hall of famer. It doesn't happen, but it happens in the world of sports. Um, I can't teach my son everything that I want him to, because that's just not how the world works. The world is going to teach him and the world of sports has done a great job in helping him understand that sometimes the ump has a bad strike zone. Sometimes, sometimes the ball just doesn't bounce your way. And other times, holy shit, you really got all of it, pal. You know, those are just incredibly important life lessons that as a parent, but also as a leader, you wish every member of your team had a had a chance to to know that and experience it. Hey Doug, so as we um, finish here, we always like to ask with this one last question. Like we've just, you know, taken a journey through your career and learned about your leadership development. Like if you, if, if I came to you and said, "Hey, I, I got a button, you can press it, you can do it all over again," would you want to walk down the same path, or would you? Is there a different path that you have in, have in your mind? It's a really it's a really hard decision to, uh, to make at this point. Um, I, I would say I probably wouldn't want to go down it on, on again, because the good was great and the bad was bad. And, you know, I'm who I am today. And I feel pretty good about the kind of human being I am today because of the good and because of the bad. Um, you know, there's always a sliding door elements to life. What happens if you went through door A versus door B? And sometimes I think about that maybe lately more than ever. Um, but I, I probably would. Uh, and I say that because, um, what I'm blessed to have in my life sure outweighs any stress or tensions that I don't, I know I've impacted people for the better professionally and personally because they've told me and I see it. So for maybe that reason, that reason alone, I would say it's probably worth staying on the same path. Yeah. I would have awesome. liked to have been the guy who invented, invented Velcro as an example. Maybe I should have done that. Um, <laughs> but still you know, time. other, other <laughs> than that, you know, I, I yeah. would say it, it's been a pretty good, pretty, pretty good run. Yeah. So to, I had two final questions. Doug. One, what's next for you? Where are you going? What are you going to do? Yeah. So, um, you know, having just stepped away from, from almost 11 years as, as the CMO of Pearl, um, you know, for me, it, it's on a professional side, moving into 
a, a larger CMO role or moving more into a brand president, CEO, GM role. That's that's mm-hmm. one sort of set of options. Um, in the immediate term, I'm actually writing a book, um, which is something I've been kind of kicking around for a while and, and finally <laughs> signed a book deal. And I'm going to write a book and, you know, Clooney's not going to play me in the movie. It's not that kind of book, <laughs> but it's it's a book that I hope, um, you know, helps to to maybe bring some insight into this world of building brands and, and creating effective okay. marketing plans. Um, but I, I think what's next for me is hopefully a bigger opportunity to continue to make a difference as a person, as a leader, and as a human being. Um, you know, there's a lot of good that can be done in the world. If you, if you do good work and you think about people, not yeah. as a number in a target audience assessment, but as human beings that you're providing a service or a product to, I hope I find myself at an organization where I can think human and uh, it wouldn't hurt to make a hell of a lot of money while doing it. So, okay. <laughs> well, Peter and I will be part of the book launch team. So let us yes, know when that's 100%. done. And yeah, yeah, yeah I can't mm-hmm. wait to read that, but I'll pre-order the, the, on my Kindle today. Yeah. <laughs> the the yeah. final question, where can people learn more about you? Where do you want us to send them? Yeah. Um, you know, my LinkedIn profile is pretty robust, so you can find, you know, the good news with having a last name like Zarkin is that it's pretty easy to find on LinkedIn. So LinkedIn's probably the the best thing. Um, or, you know, feel free to email me at douglaszarkin at gmail.com. It's probably the only time in my life I use my my, my formal Douglas name. Um, but Doug Zarkin, believe it or not, was taken on Gmail. So it's uh, <laughs> ah, douglaszarkin at, at gmail.com. But probably LinkedIn's the best thing. Great. Perfect. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Doug, thanks so much for coming on no, today's thank show. Thank you, it guys. Ple- it was a pleasure. Yeah. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Leadership Backstory. Make sure to subscribe from your favorite podcast player and leave us a review if you like what you hear. We appreciate you sharing your feedback with other listeners. Peter Barron and Brendan Schneider host The Leadership Backstory. Catch you on the next episode.